morning. I a brief introduction, that's my clan. A Maidesh Vizhni, which, as I understand it, originates from the Hamas Pueblo, uh, which is far into the New Mexico area. So, uh, interestingly, is that tomorrow I'll be sitting down with some of my Hamas relatives uh, talking about the stuff that I'm going to be talking with you today. So, and in some respects, that's deliberate because a lot of my presentation goes to an emphasis of being interpersonal, which means I like to have eye contact with you. Uh, sometimes eye contact is, is appropriate and sometimes it's not. Uh, but I, I'd like to be able to speak with you and have all of your attention, all of your consciousness. Uh, because some of the stuff that I speak about uh, can be a bit esoteric uh, and it's extremely complicated. And it's something that I'm still a student of, uh, which in other words, I'm not necessarily an expert of, but the studious part of me, every single day, virtually every moment, is constantly reflecting uh, on my, my reality in relation to one, the self, but also to others. And uh, again, I'll get more into that. So being able to stand in front of you, one, is an honor, but also it's a bit imperative to be able to convey the message that I'm trying to, to send today to you all. Um, thank you for inviting me, uh, Brian. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, uh, and of course, I know Anne-Marie sent me a text this morning indicating she wasn't going to be able to join us this morning um, as she has some familial responsibilities to attend to graduation stuff, which is very wonderful and certainly goes to what it means to be indigenous, which is essentially to be a good relative. And, uh, so I sent her my blessings and, and safe travels. Um, I'm going to read my bio here, and forgive me reading it in third person, um, but my bio begins to illustrate where I'm coming from. So um, I'm going to read this, so one, you have an idea of where I've been and what I've been up to, and um, before I get into the real meat and potatoes of my presentation. So. Uh, Eric was an inquisitive child growing up, always reflecting on himself in relation to unfamiliar others in the suburbs of Phoenix Metro. With endless questions about tradition as practiced back home in the rural rest settings of northern Arizona, raised Catholic, he sought to reconcile such teachings with the religious, traditional life of his own people. But his efforts early on revealed little. He struggled to find the kind of answers that would ease his frustrations and begin to piece together a cognitive map that could help navigate slippery concepts like spirituality and sacred, or to substantiate what it meant to be Navajo other than a demographic variable. It wasn't until he stumbled into a religious studies course at Arizona State University where he began to find answers. And those answers, which have served as a platform for evolving truths to take shape, have inspired much of his life personally and professionally. This once latchkey kid finally found the intellectual footing he longed for, igniting a personal transformation. Eric has pressed against governance at virtually all levels with what it means to be indigenous, what it means to be a good relative. That is to say, the space between our intentions and performance professionally and our conduct personally must close, especially in relation to place, from the environment to the cosmos. Western culture, of course, insists they remain separate, making it easier to disavow personal accountability for those of familial recourse. This is a challenge that Eric has failed at over the years, but not without some meaningful success, and it's because of those periodic triumphs he's able to offer insight into new ways of governance. In 2015-16, as an advisor for the Navajo Nation Office of the President and Vice President, Eric served as the founding co-chair of the Bears Ears of the Tribal Coalition, the coalition consisting of five tribes rooted in traditional religious purpose delivered its formal proposal October 15, 2015, 
The President Obama is seeking a Bears Ears National Monument of 1.9 million acres. Further, the proposal sought to establish a federal commission that would help facilitate land management planning and administration consistent with indigenous traditional knowledge systems. On December 28, 2016, President Obama proclaimed the Bears Ears National Monument of 1.35 million acres and established the Bears Ears Commission. Relatively speaking, Eric asserts that all of that was the easy part, mainly because the means to achieve such, the structures and processes are widely known. Innovating new ways of public land management using intellectual lenses of indigenous peoples, a genuinely alternative way of interpreting reality from Western thought remains the challenge. Since 2004, he has held political appointments with the Arizona Governor's Office of Equal Opportunity, State Department of Housing, there's so much I'm not going to mention here, State of Arizona, the Navajo Nation, <laughs> call it that. Um, and also, I served in the term of the Arizona State Legislature, the Arizona House of Representatives, uh, representing District 7, which was home to nine tribes of the 22 federal, federally recognized tribes. My term actually just concluded this past January. Um, but I, I share that bio largely because it's important to understand where someone is coming from. And in, and in, in speaking on behalf of Navajo communities, that's a big part of it. When we introduce our clans, we also mention who our parents are, who our grandparents are. And by virtue of that, it tells that person that I'm in front of, or who I'm communicating with, who I am. What kind of moral or ethical fabric I bring to the room. Whether or not I'm a good person or I'm a bad person. Uh, the land from which I come, who am I speaking on behalf, particularly clanship. Um, so my bio is important as it relates to me as a, as a Navajo, as a man, as a father, uh, as a former husband, um, as a son, as a brother, and so on and so forth. So that's very much a part of uh, you know, where I've been and what I, why I'm here in some respects. Um, I'm going to also read to you a part of a presentation, and I'm going to weave in and out of it to make some uh, sort of emphasize certain points, and part of it kind of goes into some of the more of the details as to the bio I just spoke to. But it's it's important to understand uh, the concepts that I'm going to give to you in a very personal way. Um, part of and this is something that Brian Deloria Jr. as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, he talks about. And it was put on the presentation. Thank you, by the way, for putting that there. It's a good segue to some of the things I'm going to assert. Is is that in the Indian conception, in terms of making sense of reality, there's an approach to abstract propositions. That was the word that he used. Well, in interpretations through an indigenous lens, abstract propositions are are for naught. We don't do that. Um, in other words, uh, we're not impersonal. We're quite personal. And that's important. That's critical. Whereas in Western, in Western concepts, um, we, we live our lives in abstractions. Um, and I'll get more into that momentarily. And so I want to reach far back into those presentations, take stock into what has transpired these days, bring it forward and inclusive of you. And, you know, a key part that's inherent in this particular seminar is common knowledge, right? What is it that I want you to do after today? The common ground. How do we find common ground amongst ourselves, given the respective paths that we've been on arriving here today? Common ground is the platform from which I hope... Um, from which uh, hope is conceived, simply because we as intelligent individuals can synthesize purpose that's mutually beneficial, inclusive of loved ones, community, and peoples. It was a critical critical aspect to the success of the Bears Ears into Tribal Coalition that originally featured the Navajo Nation and Hopi tribe co-chairing a major movement over the future of shared ancestral lands. 
If you're not familiar with how these two tribes usually behave with respect to land, we usually find ourselves at each other's necks. Any Hopi, Hopi friends in the room? Setting aside our historical differences and finding common ground proved to reveal great possibilities. And, you know, at the time, the Hopi vice chairman was uh, Alfred Lomakoro Jr. And he and I had just met. And I was looking at a lot of the, um, the happenings. The coalition was an informal one, leading years leading up to when I uh, began my participation. And simply said, we have to formalize this. And we're going to have to also demonstrate to the American public that you know, people who have routinely not got along can get along because at the end of the day, this is going to be a real fight, especially among those who don't get along. And so we have to be better and bigger than that. It's important to understand, though, that doing so was a conscious choice, having evaluated very carefully what this would mean for our peoples respectively. respectively including close analysis of where our differences ended and specifically where our commonalities began. And for those reasons, I will speak to great differences of ways of knowing and how those differences generate new ways of relating to land and managing them. I know this group knows Albert Einstein, I'm not sure, very well. And the things that he has observed in his, in his tenure, he states, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And so I'm going to do my best to try to do that. Um, but before going into the more presentation, I think it's important to acknowledge the way in which we think about the abstraction of traditional knowledge. Um, you know, in some previous presentations, there was a lot of discussion about what is traditional knowledge. And uh, Anne Marie on Wednesday observed on the international level, they don't define it. And but she, what she does do is ask us to write down on a piece of paper, and not, um, not this week, but I've seen her do it in a previous presentation, where she said, write down what is traditional knowledge to you? And of course, we all wrote down different things. Um, when I speak about traditional knowledge, I don't necessarily try to define it. Rather, I try to. Uh, encourage the audience to, to think about what it is not. Because a lot of the work that I do in governance and leadership roles that I've been uh, afforded the opportunity to, to, to perform in, um, by and large, where the river meets the road is, is identifying specifically where we differ. Because if you can't find where you differ, you have no real legitimate starting point. Because we're all starting in different places, essentially. And at the end of the day, you, you don't get out of the mud. Um, so but hopefully the, those, those ideas uh, become more concrete here uh, in, my, in my talk here. I had this pres uh, pr professor, and his name was Kenneth Morrison. And one of the things he said was, if you don't have anything to say, then don't say anything at all which was a really interesting one. I never understood what that meant um, until much later into to, to the course of study. Ken was a religious studies professor at Arizona State University, who I was fortunate enough to know. He stood firmly on the notion that it was imperative that when we write about Native American people, or anyone else for that matter, we represent them in their own terms. And we do that in part not by descriptively writing about them, but by demonstrating what is actually transpiring from their perspective. He would say, with respect to writing about indigenous peoples, show me, don't tell me. These two quotes by Einstein and Morrison haunt me largely because the subject matter I'm going to engage with you is very complex and potentially transformative. I don't proclaim to be an expert on the subject matter. However, I do claim to be an expert on where I've been, what I've done, and where I intend to go, which has all greatly benefited uh, from this course of study. In short, what I've done on Mother Earth is my demonstration, and at just a fraction of it can benefit you, I would be fully enjoyed. It was May of 2015, and I had just taken post in the Navajo Nation Office of the President and Vice President. A month later, I was asked to evaluate 
the ongoing efforts by them and informal coalition building, uh, building effort of grassroots leaders, representing the youth people, Hopi people, Zuni people, and Navajo people. And at the, at the time, I was still establishing my footing in the new administration and wasn't sure how much time I would be able to commit. But there was something peculiar about this effort. To me, it was the first time traditional knowledge would be drive, the driving force in shaping a governmental initiative, especially at such a large scale, and that got me excited. A month after that, I was in. We agreed to formalize the effort, establish co-chairs, and drive forward a formal proposal to be delivered to Washington, D.C. for the purposes of protecting and caring for our own ancestral lands using traditional knowledge. Over the course of four months, many intertribal work sessions, all of which I had the distinct honor of facilitating, we shaped the Bears Ears and the Tribal Coalition proposal addressed to Barack Obama and delivered on October 15, 2015. In the following months, we engaged Congress to explore whether critical components of our proposal could be included in legislation that would meet the needs of our peoples. However, and unfortunately, those efforts failed and at which point the coalition turned its attention to the administration, and as many of you know, those ensuing efforts amounted to a proclamation establishing the monument for 1.35 million acres in present-day Southeast Utah on December 28, 2016. Several days later, we celebrated on January 7th. It was 2002. I was enrolled at ASU, and I was essentially a kid in search of many answers as to who I was. Unbeknownst to me, I was also yearning for healing. In my very early years, my upbringing had me moved from one community to the next quite frequently, largely because the elderly family required attention of my mother, and of course, we had to go where work was. Eventually, my mother decided it was time to seek her bachelor's degree in nursing, so we packed up what little we had and we moved to the urban settings of Phoenix Metropolitan. I'll never forget my first day of third grade. Everyone looked like this audience, which is to say, not me. Early on, I knew I was different. Not so much by the way I looked, but by the things we did back home on the res. You see, I was raised Catholic as well as, quote unquote, traditional Navajo, which meant we went home for ceremonies. For those of you who are practicing Catholic know very well the Catholic Nicene Creed. It states at the beginning and at the end, we believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. End quote. To take it further, the word Catholic is derived from Greek interpretations of universal. And on the whole, and as a young boy, how was one to reconcile this with something back home that looks, sounds, and feels nothing like the Catholic Mass? So as a child, we'd go to Catholic Mass every Sunday, just my mom and I. But then we'd go home for a jomonche, different ceremonies, like blessing of ceremonies. And for whatever reason, as a young boy, I was always asking the questions, what in the world does all this mean? When we go back to Mass and they say, one, only, universal, apostolic church. Are we not breaking the rules when we go home and perform in ceremonies? And I would ask a lot of adults. I would ask a lot of folks. And nobody was able to uh, quench my thirst for answers. I never got it. And it, 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 it was perplexing to me. It bothered me. It gave me a great deal of um, you know, an unsettled feeling. I'm not Catholic anymore, nor am I a Christian. This effort remained elusive all through high school. I would ask questions to Hathathics, Navajo medicine, as to what was going on in the ceremony and how healing was achieved. He or she would explain in English because that's the language I understood, but it never added up in my head. I, of course, though, nodded along as if the explanations hit the nail on the head. I always wanted to know what it meant to be Navajo other than what it meant to be a demographic variable, as mentioned earlier. Why I was such an inquisitive kid to this end, I don't know. It's just one of those things that make me arrogant. I eventually graduated from AC with a degree in sociology, but not before meeting a professor in religious studies who introduced me to concepts that shaped an invaluable platform 
for truly acquiring knowledge. If you've heard the statement, it's possible to get an education and not acquire knowledge. I mean, how many are familiar with that? You'd be able to negotiate an institution like here and not really know what you're doing after you leave, right? <laughs> I've come to learn what that means. My first day in class, I'll never forget, Tim Morrison said, if you sign up for this class thinking you're going to learn anything about Native Americans and their religious traditions from this white honky, you might as well go elsewhere. <laughs> I'll sign your drawback slip, no questions asked. It would be irresponsible of me to claim authority of the subject matter and profess to be an expert over traditions that aren't mine. It would also be border on arrogance as well, but if you're interested in learning how Western lenses grossly misrepresent Native American religious life and how the pervasive nature of such is nothing short of injustice, we must speak and write in their terms, not ours. How many books can you find in the library right down the walkway with the PhD next to it Native or non-Native asserting authority over Native American religious life. Virtually all of them, right? Needless to say, he caught my attention. He wouldn't let you call him doctor, though he was a PhD, or professor, though he was indeed our professor, or mister, though he was, of course, a man. He preferred Ken. Anything else was an insult that, such that his personhood would not be objectified. He would say, you itted me. Don't do that. <laughs> of course, there was a lot of scholarship behind this and also much healing for him, something I could relate to, but of course in different ways. The path that brought him to that intersect with me was entirely different, and our paths since weren't much different, with the exception of our lasting friendship Mentorship and what many uh, who were fortunate and, and what many who were fortunate enough to know referred to him as kinship. Of course, a play on kinship. My first conversation I had with him was another to remember. He asked me what I was majoring, and I told him sociology. And his immediate response was, "Well, that's dehumanizing." Of course, I wondered, what in the world is this guy talking about? I'm majoring in sociology for very humanistic reasons, really my humanistic reasons. I came from a bit of a broken home. In short, I hated with a passion the times when my mother and father would have to interface in my presence. They were divorced and for quite unpleasant reasons. My nervousness, anxiety, worry, fear, stress peaked during those times. It's because of those traumatic experiences, right? I always told myself I would grow up and do better such that my kids wouldn't have to experience what I did. How many of you in the audience can relate to that in your own way? Sociology, in particular sociology of the marriage and family at the time, seemed to offer harbor for an ailing soul seeking personal resolve. So when Ken Morrison called my academic endeavors dehumanizing, I found myself scratching my head. I eventually came to learn what Ken meant. Sociology and essentially all social, social cultural disciplines study abstract concepts about people rather than engage people interpersonally and on their own terms. We know this to be true when we're queered for polls, surveys, and census count. Statistics, research methods, and likewise tools try to encapsulate us to formulate theory and assert truths for a person, persons, or a people, right? If you think about it, that, allows, that alone sounds gross. That alone sounds quite detached from my personal experiences, the very experiences that take residence in only my consciousness and subconsciousness. How many of you have especially during this political turmoil of, of time, you know, there's a lot of politics that unfolds. It comes to you in the mailings, it comes to you phone calls, particularly during election time, you get a lot of queries, right, surveys. And you might answer them, and you answer them meaningfully based on what you think, what you feel, what's important to you yourself. But of course, when it gets spit out in public, it says nothing like what you meant, right? It's difficult to relate to that. 
So it basically has nothing to do with you. You're just simply a statistic, a piece of data. Or how many of you are borderline crazy? Raise your hands. <laughs> maybe maybe need some therapy. If you go and sit down with a therapist trained in psychology or sociology, what are they going to do to you? They're going to take all of their experiences, all of that theory, which is based on just that. Statistics. Predetermined questions. Gather the data. They ask you your age, your name, your geographic location. They ask you how many kids you have, what's your income. All these abstractions that begin in their minds to, to, to tell you something, to tell them something about you. And then when you're done spilling out your personal feelings, you're done divulging everything that's personal to you, then they try to heal you with these abstract concepts, right? See how these abstractions, something that Vaughn Deloria was observing, these abstract propositions, would begin to tell us something about the world? I'm not even talking about the world. I'm talking about you as a person, you as a living, breathing being who's conscious, who has agency, who has intelligence, who has the capacity to speak with intentionality, who has causality for better or worse. You are alive, right? I say this not to explain why I despise my degree, and I do. Rather, to begin to illustrate how professionals trained in Western academics can inadvertently get it wrong. How our intellectual faculty can begin to lend itself to the objectification of a person, or how Ken used to put it, hitting someone. What's scary is that things, quote-unquote, can be replaced, ignored, discounted, or worse, ended without, re end, ended without remorse. There's perhaps professional accountability in this day and age. That's even a stretch, particularly on the political front. But very little personal accountability. So how do we begin to correct the ways we think about, write about, and work alongside indigenous peoples of North America and really the world over? How does one go about acknowledging traditional knowledge, ways of knowing that are genuinely alternative from Western ways of knowing? Ken offered scholarship that wove together ontology, epistemology, and axiology with, with underpins that differentiate Western philosophy from perhaps an indigenous one. What follows in my presentation is an approach not necessarily that's the approach to better representing indigenous peoples, but rather a approach. Whether it is introductory in no way intended to blow your hair back in one sitting, that is impossible. It took me months to years of mind-numbing study to finally begin to extract myself from the Western philosophical apparatus that we've all been raised in. What is... Um, Western thought, how, or rather, not so much what is Western thought, how do you categorize the way you interpret reality? Can someone answer that? How do you, you have five senses, right? Western science observes you have five senses. Indigenous peoples would observe that a little differently, but nonetheless, you have five senses for the purposes of this exercise. Sight. So Hearing, taste, touch, etc. How do you, you woke up this morning, you came here today, you're going to live on the rest of the day until you're unconscious at night, and you do it all over again tomorrow. How do you interpret reality? Or how do you categorize it? I heard subjective, that's one. What else? So, lenses is your intellect the way you're using it, and language is a, a mode of communication. But once you use your intellect and using that mode of communication, how do you, in your own brain, how do you interpret reality? What are the categories you use? Well, thinking is the process, but what are the categories? A sense of place. Well, there's, there's place, which is subjective, right? The idea, because the, the, this woman in the back mentioned subjectivity. This is a very much a philosophical part of the discussion. Gentlemen? Yeah, I, uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid, I worked with my uncle. We were building a barn, and uh, we were putting 
some stuff together and then he said, Brian, you have no sense at all. And, uh, and I dug in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid you're right. I have no change. I have no sense. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, you're about the second dumbest thing in the world. And I said, uh, well, who's the first? I <laughs> you, because we're the only two working, right? And uh, he laughed and we laughed. And I, I didn't know. I was just a kid. So when you talk about reality, you're brainwashed. Or you go back as a kid and you accept reality for what it is and then interpret it. But then if you try to define it without the definitions of the answers, you just don't know. Well, I think, Juan, thank you for that story. Um, I'm glad it was comical for you and not, <laughs> not, not, not traumatic. Um, but I want to jump right into this just because uh, I'm, I'm going to be running for time here. But it, those experiences that, that you just mentioned, they only exist in your mind, in some respects in the subconscious. Uh, that's a subjective observation. It's not objective, right? Unless if it was recorded, documented, then it becomes objective, something that we can begin to, for the rest of us to see and potentially experience. But it's a subjective accounting of a personal experience. What I'm getting at is, is that Western philosophy reduces everything that we discern into two categories. This is a bit of a stretch, and maybe to a degree uh, an overgeneralization, but the point, purpose is what I'm trying to convey is, is that we have subjectivity and we have objectivity. That is Western thought. I've spoken to some of this, and I'm sure folks in the room are quite familiar with what an object is. But let's add some more. It's inanimate, lifeless, impersonal, dispassionate, and unemotional. With respect to sentence structure, it relates to or denotes a case of nouns and pronouns used as the object of a transitive verb or a preposition. I don't know how many of you get flashbacks to elementary school hearing that, but I do. Isn't it interesting that we socialize and educate our children how to think and interpret reality with the English language? Invariably, with the language alone, objects and objectivity, objectivity exist. Presumably, it's benign. When really, when you start talking about indigenous peoples, it's, it's not. It's problematic. It complicates things. You actually get it wrong. Um, imagine a language where you live your entire life where there's no nouns. I just asked my son the other day, I have three sons, they're ages uh, 10, 11, 12. The 10 year old turns 10 in July. It's just fun to say 10, 11, 12. <laughs> How many parents get to see their kids were in grades one, two, three? Um, but I asked my kids, what is a noun? And my, my eldest immediately says, a noun is a person, place, or thing, or sometimes an idea. I thought, wow, he's paying attention in school. A noun is a person, place, or thing. The vast majority of our intellect in Western lenses goes to objectifying things. Right? Abstractions. Um, and but imagine a language where you didn't have nouns. Imagine a language, try to, where it was descriptive, such that it lended the possibility that these quote-unquote objects were either alive or had the potential to be alive. And the communication via that language, of course I'm speaking about indigenous language, does not assume that things are dead or inanimate. In Western thinking, we personify animism, right? Myth. Uh, these are really, really problematic terms. So in other words, if you only speak English like me, you're already handicapped, dead on arrival, with respect to fully grasping the concepts that say our Atathi here lives with, 
in any other medicine people or people who you don't have to be a medicine person to understand this this is simply is, is that indigenous populations interpret the reality generally exclusive from western assertions that is i say a fact and the problem that we have is is that we use english and it's spanish french italian all the latin based languages are fundamentally flawed in being able to convey these concepts because the nouns alone mess it all up that's really a critical key point that we have to observe here but what about subjectivity so that was objectivity what about subjectivity i'm going to read um when i was doing the bears years work i was approached to to to, to write for archaeology southwest of course i had problems with the archaeology field as i mentioned mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, anthropology or archaeology, there's a heck of a lot of objectivity goes on in there. But anyhow, this is what I write, and I hope it kind of helps illustrate this point further. To better understand indigenous connections with and perspectives on the Verzer's landscape, it helps to consider different ways of knowing. Intelligence, awareness, reason, faith, desire, personal agency, these are wired into our human brains. But there are indigenous ways of knowing that are very different from Western philosophical and cultural conventions. These concern concepts of personhood and interconnectedness. Classical Western perspectives tend to emphasize the self and individuality, yet there are cultures that understand the self as invariably tied to others, as a constitution and an assertion of existence, in networks of kinship, clanship, and standing familial responsibilities. In these cultures, the self is in a constant state of creating and recreating reality with others. The self is inextricably part of a collective of beings. And in, indigenous per and, in, and in, in indigenous perspectives, it is not only humans that are capable of participating, participating in a conscious, willing collective. Tribal knowledge holds that what Western cultures might think of as things or quote unquote wildlife, such as rocks, wind, and water, actually have agency the potential to be alive and the capability to think intelligently and intentionally. These are quote unquote, other than human persons. Participants in the cosmos who for better or worse as a matter of positive or negative reciprocity commune with us. They are bestowed with respective powers and gifts by creative forces pursuant to indigenous creation stories. When indigenous peoples are asked what they think about the bear's ears, their answers come through these other wholly valid ways of knowing. Listen very carefully. So, if a Western lens is problematic, which I feel like I've demonstrated that already, then what gives someone like you hope? How can someone like you begin, just begin, to understand the complexities, the dense, the vast, and depth bodies of knowledge that come through an indigenous lens. Something that, if you're, by the looks of the people in here, you're much older than me. If you can go back to your younger years and begin to redo it all, what, you know, just, just think about that, right? And, and if you could, and you say, well, then, if Western lenses is part of the problem, then what's the alternative? How can someone like me begin to make sense of this? Well, the purpose of my presentation here goes to cognitive mapping of the traditional knowledge, of traditional knowledge. And it goes to, and this is something that I'm doing on a daily basis now, the reason why I'm heading out to visit with some of the folks with Hamas, because Hamas claims and they very much, it's obviously observed, is that they have ancestral lands in the Verzer's landscape, though they're not part of the governmental factors. They're not part of the, the official Verzer's and the tribal coalition, but their truths are no more and no less than the Dene people, Hopi people, Zuni people. And the same will go over the San Juan Southern Paiute people. There's a lot of peoples that claim ancestral ties to, to that landscape. Um, but one of the things that we begin to um, talk about think critically about and analyze is how can the American people begin, just begin to comprehend the, these complexities for the purposes of carrying out 
the Bears Ears National Monument Proclamation, which calls for the use of traditional law and knowledge alongside Western science for the purposes of planning and the administration of public lands. It's the law. It's the only law that I know of that one observes traditional knowledge as a legitimate, exclusive body of knowledge, but also intends to use it in administration. There's a lot of really powerful laws out there, would be it NACPRA or, or what have you, you know, the Indian Religious, uh, Religious Act, and you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there, but they don't do what this proclamation does. So it's really neat, it's unprecedented, and it's exciting. But, but get that, if you go back and read the proclamation, it says, use Western science as well as traditional knowledge, use it. What I just got done saying is, is that you, even the English language begins to make this problematic. And for someone like you, who've never heard anything like what I've just said, how do you even begin to do that? Because, of course, by imagine this can be happy written using English characters. You have to produce a model. And it's what I refer to as person, power, gift, place. Ben Morrison offered person, power, gift, and it corresponds with ontology, epistemology, and axiology. From a very simple perspective, it goes to personhood, it goes to power, and it goes to gift, be it positive or negative reciprocity. And then, of course, at the end of the day, it reconciles the place. In Navajo terms, it's sahakes, nata, inna, sehasin. It corresponds. So we use a traditional framework, and it's sahakes, of course, is thought. It goes to consciousness, right? Nata is planning. But within, within the context of that concept, you get power, which of course goes to the study of knowledge, epistemology. And you get to inna, which is where the rubber meets the work, which is where you work hard throughout the day, where things happen as you go moment to moment with these beings, be they cosmic beings, the four-legged, the insects, the winged people, so on and so forth. Stuff is happening. And if you're a good person, good things happen. And if you work especially hard and you achieve your goals, meaning your thought was in the right place, you offer your tadadin in the morning, and you strategized accordingly, at the end of the day, you get to celebrate, reflect. You get to assert that all is well. And you get to do it in reconciliation with place. Sehasin. If you go to the Hopis, and you go to the Zinnis, and you go to the folks I'm meeting with tomorrow, the Hamas people, theirs is a similar way. It goes, of course, in a circular fashion, but the concepts of how you begin to break down the self in relation to others, what it means to be a good relative, you get the same bodies of knowledge. Except for them, they go counterclockwise. And for him as people, there's, there's the four directions, but also there's north and true north. So there are some, there are some differences with respect to tribes. So we're not going to pile everybody into the same thing, but with respect to the interpretation of reality, we're talking something vastly different than, than the lenses that you all primarily use. So it becomes extremely difficult, in some respects almost impossible. But the possibilities is rooted in this model we refer to as person, power, gift, place. Where at first you begin early day law, which is to the east consciousness, right when you wake up. What are the first things that come to your mind when you wake up? What am I going to eat? Should I brush my teeth? <coughs> Maybe not. Coffee. I'm going to say, do I have two minutes? I'm in charge. Five minutes. Well, those early thoughts are actually pretty important because they assert to the universe, to the cosmos, with, along with yourself, what you're going to do. If you think negative thoughts, man, you're going to have an awful day. It's a very powerful moment, particularly as it relates to what you do in those first moments, particularly when these beings come in, I don't call them holy people, but you, you're often referred to them as holy people. The reason why I don't use holy, I don't use celestial, I don't use sacred, I don't use spiritual, because either they invoke Judeo-Christian influence, which seriously distorts the, the bodies of knowledge, um, and I don't use spirituality, simply because I don't know what that means. You start talking about metaphysical beings, it, I don't know what that means because when I'm talking, when I'm looking at Dian the Men, who is our quote whole holy people, they actually have names that I can communicate with them. I can relate to them, no different than you and I are related to one another. 
There's this interpersonal, intersubjective way of interpreting reality. And that's where I'm getting into. You have objectivity, subjectivity. What's the alternative? You remove objectivity and subjectivity from your, 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 your briefcase, and you insert a reality that's rooted in intersubjectivity. Subjectivity is such that you're conscious. You have a mind. Your ontology allows for that. But so does other beings, other than human beings, who also have a subjectivity. The problem with subjectivity is it only speaks to, and this is a philosophical point, that it only speaks to the self, which goes to being selfish. Indigenous peoples are not selfish beings. What does it mean to be indigenous? Well, I always say it means to be a good relative. But the problem, the difference is, is that our relations doesn't just end with your mother and your grandfather and your children. It goes to clanship. And even beyond that, it goes to other clans. And beyond that, it goes to your people. And even beyond the people, it goes to these other than human beings who are cosmic. There are relatives. And if you don't treat them and think about them and behave amongst them appropriately, it'd be no different than me meeting you in an alley and punching you in the face. What's going to happen? You're probably going to punch me back, right? There are rules that govern our conduct. And, and the net thinking, generally speaking, it's referred to as cat. Cat is such a simple concept. But at the same time, when you begin to unpack it, it's extremely complicated. It goes to the vast knowledge of, of the net people. And I mostly speak only on behalf of the net people because that's who I am. But when you begin to look at all of these other indigenous peoples around the world, they have their own form of governance and that governs how they conduct themselves. And I know that my Che here talks about natural law. That's the governance. And it's unforgiving. Some people go into these professional worlds and they think, well, this is just a professional thing I gotta do. I, the, the laws don't care. <laughs> If you conduct yourself inappropriately, the reciprocity can be hurtful. But on the flip side, though, there's also a lot of gifts and blessings and love and care and joy to be had if you live according to the way you're supposed to be living. And so a lot of this stuff has to get placed on the table with respect to using Bears Ears uh, National Monument in terms of land management because it's not a static thing. It's a very dynamic thing, as you can tell. But it's also something that has to be advised and observed and, and lived on a day-to-day -day purpose. So in terms of Western governance, you can't write policy and simply say that's how the government's going to work. No, we're talking about something very different. So it's exciting to work on the Bearsers National Monument and begin to start to put together stuff that's really unprecedented. How do you begin to manage land through the lens of the net people? And the challenge, of course, is that we have four of the tribes, but really we have many more than that. Um, that we have to incorporate into how, how this is going to work. Now, here's one last point I'm going to mention, because I know I'm running out of time. And this is a critique of our own tribal governments, as well as the federal government. Imagine this. You hire an attorney, you hire an archaeologist, and you hire somebody from the field of biology to work on taking care of these ancestral lands under the guise of traditional knowledge. What are you going to get? You're going to get a duplication of Western sciences, right? What do the tribes employ? My tribe has a bunch of attorneys. My tribe has a bunch of anthropologists. My tribe has a bunch of sociologists. My tribe has a bunch of people in the hard sciences. So we're asking Navajo people who are Western educated to go and use traditional knowledge. What are they going to do? They're going to invoke Western sciences again. So in other words, when you look at the Bears Ears Proclamation and what the tribes are doing right now, which I lose sleep at night because it just angers me, they went and hired staff who are essentially what I just told you. We're looking at a duplication of work. And so in other words, even if you're native, 
And even if you're the president of a tribe or a governor of a tribe or a chairman of a tribe, a chairwoman, a councilwoman, you can still get it wrong by not simply being aware that the fact that, one, English is fundamentally problematic, two, you're using a Western lens, and three, there is very much a lacking model that begins to allow for that shift to happen. You have to begin to, to move from objectivity, subjectivity to an intersubjectivity, intersubjective way of thinking. And really, as Native people, that's our responsibility of just simply being. I'm trying to live my life in such a way where culture, Navajo culture, doesn't exist. Because I will have gone full circle in such a way that I simply am. Well, a really interesting, a really good person who did her dissertation on Hoan, which is uh, the, the traditional dwelling of Navajo people, um, she observes it using these lenses, this person power gift place model, and she observes Hoan as a living, breathing being, or even a composite of beings, and how we constantly relate to, to this particular structure. Um, very insightful, a white woman, a really close friend of mine, very powerful in her own right. She simply said, look at rap culture. Rap music, rap dancing. I don't, I'm not into rap music, that's not my thing. But imagine this. You see somebody who listens to the music, who talks like it, dresses like it, they are it. To simply ask that person about rap culture is to simply say that there's an abstraction. There's something that is alienated from their particular being. They don't see themselves as studying rap culture and then emulating it. They simply are. Similar concept with indigenous peoples. A lot of our people live in such a way where we say, that's Navajo culture, and I'm going to aspire to be like that. How do you close that gap to the point to where you simply are? There's no such thing as Navajo culture. What makes it have a culture is the fact that Western lenses asserts and demands that it's an abstraction that is alienated from any given human. And that's just wrong. So. This is a critique on Western thinking. The cognitive map first requires you to extract yourself from these Western ways of thinking about the self and others. And then hopefully find a place where you can actually understand Native American religious life on the, their terms. Genuine to their own. Anything else is of, of injustice. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I have much time for um, Q&A, but...